Thank you. The next item of business is a statement by Ivan McKee on 2023-24 uh, provisional outturn. The Minister will take questions at the end of his statement and therefore there should be no interventions or interruptions. And I call on Ivan McKee, uh, up to 10 minutes please, Minister. <laughs> Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, I welcome the opportunity today to update Parliament on the provisional outturn against the budget for the financial year 2023-24. The provisional outturn demonstrates once again that this Government is prudently and competently managing Scotland's finances while protecting our priorities and ensuring that we have sustained effective delivery of public services. Managing the financial position for 2023-24 once again represented a significant challenge. The continued impact of persistently high inflation, pressure on public sector pay, backlogs as a result of the COVID pandemic and the ongoing war in Ukraine combined have placed pressure on the public finances. In addition, inflationary pressures continued to impact households and businesses across the country. The Scottish Government's budget must balance each and every financial year. The majority of our funding continues to be tied to the decisions of the UK Government and as such is subject to high levels of uncertainty until very late in the financial year. While the fiscal framework was revised in August 2023 and does offer some additional flexibility, we are still unable to borrow to meet day-to-day -day costs. Our income tax powers do not allow changes to be made during the current financial year. The only real lever we have to respond to emerging pressures and ensure we balance the budget is to reprioritise current spending, year spending plans. No one should underestimate the scale of that challenge. Our spending is committed to supporting vital public services. The Cabinet Secretary for Finance and Local Government has already made clear to this Parliament some of the difficult choices that had to be taken over the course of this year. It is with careful management and rigorous reprioritisation that Scottish Government funding has been channelled to where it is needed most. However, this statement is not just about the challenges we have had to manage. I also want to underline the positives. We have continued to proactively drive efficiency savings and to maximise income streams. In 2023-24, we supported fair and affordable pay deals for workers who provide their essential public services, thereby avoiding strike action and minimising further disruption for the people of Scotland. Through meaningful engagement with trade unions and employers, the Scottish Government provided a record junior doctor pay deal and an increased agenda for change pay deal. Over the past two years, we have invested an additional £1 billion in NHS agenda for change pay to support staff through the cost of living crisis. We spent nearly £5.2 billion on social security benefits, including £429 million on the Scottish Child Payment, a payment unique to Scotland, lifting families out of poverty and helping with the cost of living crisis. The carer support payment was introduced in pilot areas, which once fully rolled out in 2024, will allow thousands more unpaid carers to receive the benefit. During 2023-24, we also widened the eligibility for Best Start Foods, which will see an estimated 20,000 people able to access money to help provide milk and healthy food for their children. We spent over £160 million in 2023-24 on the Ukrainian resettlement programme to ensure people continued to receive a warm Scots welcome and are supported to rebuild their lives in our communities for as long as they need to call Scotland home. We continue to support a strong Scottish economy. The 2023 EY Attractiveness Survey showed that Scotland has outpaced both the UK and Europe for the second year in a row in attracting inward investment projects. Indeed, Scotland has been the top performing part of the UK for inward investment projects outside of London for the past eight years. We continue to outperform the UK as a whole in delivering long-term reductions in Scotland's greenhouse gas emissions and, achieving, and to achieve net zero emissions by 2045. Domestically, we have continued support for our multi-year Just Transition Fund grant funding with £16.8 million spent on projects to deliver our Just Transition aims and positive impacts for the North East and Murray regions. In addition, in 2023, we committed, allocated and spent another £3 million to support vulnerable global communities address loss and damage, bringing our total commitment to £10 million. In rail services, revenue growth exceeded budget forecasts due to effective delivery of services and the benefits of partnership working with the trade unions under the public sector railway. In Scotland, we avoided the costly industrial relations disruption that impacted other rail operators. Enhanced deployment of customer support teams helped reduce fare evasion and antisocial behaviour, thereby building customer confidence and increasing revenue. 
a continued focus on controlling the cost of delivery has contributed to the improvement of the net cost of delivery in Scotland's rail service. The finalisation of the closure of the previous finance agreement, the franchise agreement for ScotRail also resulted in a one-off receipt back to the Government from Abellio. This and other savings generated as part of our work to make our public sector more efficient and to release more funds to the front line have resulted in savings across a number of portfolios which have contributed to our underspend in 2023-24. These savings are welcome and are, as a consequence, available to support essential service, services in this current financial year. We will continue to press the UK Government to provide funding to meet pressures and to allow us to deliver a broad range of high-quality public services and improve the lives of the people of Scotland. The Scottish Government is absolutely committed to delivering on our priorities, priorities which have the most immediate benefit for our people in their everyday lives, by eradicating child poverty, growing a thriving economy, ensuring sustainable and excellent public services and tackling the climate emergency. Turning now, presiding officer, to the 2023 provisional outturn. Under the current devolution settlement, the Scottish Government is not permitted to overspend its budget. We must therefore operate within a tight margin of just over 1%. The level of volatility in our overall funding envelope continues to increase. Our block grant is not finalised until February each year. We only receive confirmation of an additional half a billion pounds of funding just six weeks before the end of the financial year. Whilst we welcome that additional funding, the timing highlights the challenge in managing the financial position. Despite this volatility, I am pleased to confirm that the Scottish Government has once again delivered a balanced budget with a provisional fiscal outturn for 23-24 of £49.3 billion against a total fiscal budget of £49.6 billion. The remaining budget of £292 million, which represents just 0.6 per cent of our total budget, will be carried forward in full through the Scotland Reserve, if confirmed at final outturn. This incorporates £162 million of fiscal resource, £130 million of capital and a break-even position in financial transactions. I must stress there is no loss of spending power to the Scottish Government as a result of this small underspend. £109 million of the capital underspend was anticipated at the spring budget revision, and the resource position around £100 million is required to annually uh, manage the post-year-end audit adjustments, with the remainder to be utilised to support the 2024-25 budget. The First Minister highlighted as part of setting out his priorities for Scotland to Parliament in May the enormous financial pressures facing the Scottish Government. And as has been said before, we are required to manage our spend against an annual budget which is not confirmed until the final quarter of the financial year. We cannot overspend. Therefore, our financial strategy is to plan a modest underspend to mitigate the risks of post-year-end audit adjustments, as have occurred in previous years. Managing the position to a 0.6 per cent underspend underlines the financial competence of this Government. I know colleagues across the Chamber follow these matters closely and that, for the most part, they have a robust understanding of the intricacies of accounting standards. I am sure, therefore, that I do not need to remind them that an element of our budget allocation from HM Treasury is non-cash, which is used for accounting adjustments, predominantly depreciation. To reiterate previous references to this ring-fenced budget, it cannot be used to support day-to-day -day spending, nor does it flow to the Scotland Reserve and is therefore not included in our headline provisional outturn results. For 2023-24, this shows an underspend of £1.1 billion against a budget of £2.5 billion. A large proportion, circa £0.9 billion of this budget, relates to non-cash consequentials for student loan impairments, which are simply not required at the same level in Scotland because, of course, of our policy of free university tuition. Finally, I want to emphasise that the figures I am reporting to you today remain provisional, as they are subject to change pending completion of the 2023-24 year-end audits. Finalised figures will be reported as usual in the annual Scottish Government Consolidated Accounts and a statement of total outturn later this financial year. President Officer, I commend today's figures to the Parliament. Thank you, Minister. The Minister will now take questions on the issues raised in his statement. I intend to allow around 20 minutes for questions, after which uh, we will move on to the next item of business. And I would invite those members who wish to seek to ask a question to please press the request to speak buttons. And I call Liz Smith. Uh, thank you. Can I thank the Minister for prior sight? And uh, he's absolutely correct to say that the Scottish Government cannot overspend its budget, and he's also quite correct to say that any underspend 
does not equate to any funds that are lost to the Scottish Government. But what the final uh, outturn uh, statement uh, does do is to provide uh, detail about the choices that are being made by the Scottish Government uh, and in what time period when it comes to spending the funds available to him. So can I first of all ask the uh, Minister if he accepts the recent Fraser of Allender Institute statistics which show that excluding the COVID spend, the block grant for the 2023-24 outturn period when measured against the current prices, was higher than in previous years and therefore benefiting Scottish Government spending. Does he accept that? <coughs> Secondly, does he recognise why there are many in the education sectors who might feel uh, very let down by the extent of the underspend in that portfolio when there are so many very immediate and pressing issues in our colleges and universities, especially regarding skills and training budgets, and thirdly, on, on a different but nonetheless related issue, when it comes to spending taxpayers' money, the Scottish Government has, uh, by its own admission in some ways, got itself into a complete muddle over uh, EU funds, what was available to spend in a particular time period and what had to be handed back. So can I ask the Minister what the Scottish Government is doing to improve the transparency of public spending as requested by Audit Scotland? Minister. Uh, I thank Liz Smith for the questions and I uh, appreciate her recognition. I'm of uh, the, 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 uh, the process with regards to these numbers and the fact that uh, they are, uh, the money is not lost. Um, indeed, it goes back to the Scotland Reserve and is available to spend this year. And a significant portion of the headline number is non-cash that we cannot, uh, of course, translate into uh, spending on day-to-day -day activities. Um, I think uh, the reality is that the Scotland's budget from the UK in real terms has been, uh, has been reduced. Um, and if you look back over the period, I think you'll find that that is indeed, indeed the case. And that is why we're and the difficult, indeed unprecedentedly difficult fiscal position that we find ourselves in. With regard to spending on education, um, the, uh, the, the, clearly the, the, the issue of priorities, that's clearly something that's set out when the government sets out its budget. What we're going through today, of course, is the outturn numbers that compare back against those budgets as uh, laid out by the government and uh, 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 approved by Parliament. Um, and, of course, uh, the, the government gives a, a huge priority to our education system, not just just for the benefit it delivers for the individuals, uh, the, the, the benefit as a consequence of that, but the wider societal and economic benefits that uh, uh, our uh, schools, colleges and universities provide as a consequence of the funding that comes to them from the Scottish Government's budget. And in this issue of transparency, I am uh, committed to ensuring that we are as transparent as possible in terms of the, the funding that uh, we, uh, we provide and the way that that funding is managed. And as I take forward my work as uh, uh, Minister for Public Finance and Indeed, the, the work I'm leading on public sector reform, uh, that will indeed, uh, of course, be the case. Thank you. And I call Michael Mara, who's joining us online. Mr Mara. Thank you, President Officer, and thank you to the Minister for advance sight of the statement. There is wide agreement that the rampant inflation delivered by the UK Tory government has put great pressure on finances. Unfortunately, today the Minister appears to believe that unlimited amounts of uncosted government borrowing is the solution rather than the cause of that chaos. The figures today laid before us show considerable underspend in capital budgets, and that is in addition to the hundreds of millions of pounds of EU funds that have been lost due to this government's incompetence. We do need a long-term commitment to growing our economy and our tax base. So when will Parliament see the delayed medium-term financial strategy? Can the Minister guarantee that the strategy will include a plan to close what was a £1.9 billion black hole between what this government has promised to do and the messes it made of the public finances? And do ministers actually understand the fiscal framework, given that the governing party yesterday published a disastrous tax policy agenda that independent experts have shown to be completely incompetent? Minister. Wow, where to start with that tirade? Um, I think the, the number of inaccuracies in there, it would take me quite, a number, uh, quite an amount of time to unpick. But to pick up on some of the issues, um, Michael Mara should be aware, I'm sure he is aware, um, of the very limited borrowing powers that the Scottish Government has at its disposal, which are only there um, on resource spending to allow us to smooth out year, on, year to year, um, uh, uh, year, to year spending um, and ensure that we've got that ability, that very, very limited ability to move funds where necessary from one financial year to the following. What we don't have um, is the ability to borrow significant amounts of, uh, uh, of uh, cash on the, uh, uh, on the markets to be able to invest 
invest in capital projects. And if you look at the reasons why productivity in the UK and indeed Scotland is lower than comparable nations, it all points back to a lack of that capital investment and the constraints that we have placed on us and the reductions in capital spending as a consequence of UK government um, uh, 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 approach to this has significantly held back our ability to grow productivity in Scotland. Having said that, it has grown at twice the rate over recent years of the rest of uh, the UK. Uh, the medium-term financial strategy uh, was uh, not published. I understand that was because of the pre-election PERDA period. Um, the Cabinet Secretary has written to FPAC uh, and will be uh, producing that, uh, that document um, once we are back in September uh, for FPAC and for the Parliament to, uh, to review. Um, and uh, the Michael Mara also mentions um, uh, inflation, and of course that is a significant part of the policies of, uh, the, pre of the current Conservative Government. Um, and, uh, but I think it is also very important to recognise that, based on their figures, um, were uh, UK Labour to come to power in, uh, in a couple of weeks' time, they would continue with the investment proposals of the UK Government and would have to find £18 billion pounds of cuts, um, as independent experts have recognised as a consequence. And the impact of that on Scotland, of course, would be nothing short of disastrous. Absolutely. I call Michelle Thompson to be followed by Murdo Fraser. Ms Thompson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Austerity, the political choice of the Conservatives over many years, and the future direction of a potential Labour government, as confirmed by the IFS, has had an unacceptable impact on Scotland's budget. Can the Minister outline what impacts cuts have had on Scottish public finances and can he advise what assessment has been made of the impact of the further cuts outlined by the IFS and likely to be taken forward by a Labour government? Minister. Uh, I thank Michelle Thompson for that question and it follows on very nicely from uh, my response, previous response to Michael Mara. It's highlighted recently by uh, the Institute of Fiscal Studies. Whoever wins the election uh, in the UK, uh, unprotected budgets could face cuts of uh, at least £18 billion and possibly as high as £20 billion by 2028-29. 20, uh, we do not know what this means for our budget. As the IFS have also pointed out, there is um, zero detail from either the Conservatives or indeed the Labour Party about where those cuts might fall. However, decisions by the current UK Government have already cost Scotland Scotland up to 1.6 billion in potential consequentials, and it's clear that any future UK government is likely to deliver more uh, of the same austerity, unfortunately, for Scotland. Murdo Fraser to be followed by John Mason. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The underspend on capital announced by the Minister is £130 million, the highest level in five years yep. and more than four times the level in the previous year. Yep. This is against a backdrop, of course, where vital capital projects such as duelling of the A9 mm -hmm. are not being progressed. Yep. How can the Minister have any credibility in complaining about a reduction in the capital budget from the UK Treasury yeah, yeah. when their capital underspend has quadrupled? Minister. I expected better from Murdo Fraser, to be honest. I thought he would have understood how these numbers work. Um, we have a total capital budget of uh, more than uh, £5 billion, um, which, of course, is, is not adequate for the investment we need to make and is suffer as a, cut, a consequence of UK government cuts um, and underspend of just over £100 million amounts to about one week's worth of capital works. Um, and that, of course, moves into the next financial year, this current financial year, and, of course, has been deployed um, to uh, support capital programmes in the, in the current budget period. Um, and, of course, the, the reason for that is because a slippage of a, a few days in a capital project is something that you would not find unexpected um, in, in any scenario. And I thought Murdo Fraser would have had a, a more substantial appreciation of the mechanics of how these numbers work and, uh, and how they relate to each other. I call John Mason to be followed by Sarah Boyack. Thank you. Can I congratulate the government on coming within 0.6 per cent of its budget? I think many other organisations and governments would be amazed if they could come as close as that. He mentioned volatility increasing, and I wonder if that's to do with the like, demand-led social security, or if he could make any other comments about this volatility increasing. Minister. Uh, yes, there are some demand-led projects. They are some of the reasons for the underspend in different portfolios have identified as being through uh, being more efficient at delivering those services. Some of it has been uh, a, a reduced, uh, lower than anticipated take-up of demand-led services. But I think I have to say that the biggest volatility and the hardest part of the, uh, the, the, the fiscal um, position to manage is uh, the lack of uh, certainty uh, in terms of consequentials received from UK government. And as indicated, 
updated my statement, um, around half a billion of that only became uh, firmed up in the last uh, few weeks of the previous financial year, making it very difficult um, and challenging to manage the, uh, the underspend to within uh, those limits. But a very good job, I have to say, was, was done to bring that within just 0.6 per cent of the total budget position. I call Sarah Boyack to be followed by Jackie Dunbar. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I draw members' attention to my register of interest in relation to the SFHA? Minister, the issue of capital spending and that massive underspend of £130 million. Um, previously, you dismissed this as being just a couple of days and a project being late, but surely that capital spending could have been used. We've got NHS projects that have been put on hold, we've got a housing emergency, but surely that £130 million could have been allocated to see the urgently needed homes that could have been built tackling homelessness and creating local jobs. Can't we just get on with this now and not see underspend? Minister. Well, I have to say I'm even more disappointed in Sarah Boyack, who I thought had a, a, a better grasp of this um, uh, than Murdo Fraser. Um, it's a £5 billion spend over the year. Um, the money appears in the accounts at the point at which the, the service, in this case the construction or other capital investment project, is actually delivered, not when it's committed. Um, and this, as I said, is just, if you work out the numbers, uh, uh, it's, it's one week's worth of, uh, of work. Um, that money, of course, is not lost, so the idea that it could magically appear in addition to the money we're spending this year to build uh, additional um, infrastructure um, or, uh, or, or buildings is, is absolutely not the case because that money um, of course we spent immediately we started into this financial year at the beginning of April uh, and will continue to be so throughout the course of this year. So it really is um, a very small part of the total five billion budget. The important point um, that Sarah Black would be better uh, serving her constituents and the people of Scotland to focus on is this significant cuts in capital budget from the UK government to the amount of money available to the Scottish government to spend and what she's doing to make sure that any incoming Labour government um, significantly increases the capital uh, spend available uh, for, uh, for Scotland. There's absolutely no uh, indication of that from the numbers that the IFS have, positioned, uh, have published with regards to uh, Labour's plans should they come into office in a couple of weeks' time. I call Jackie Dunbar to be followed by Ross Greer. Given the delays which we have seen in terms of the UK Government providing clarity on consequentials, can the Minister provide any further information regarding what impact this has had on planning for the Scottish Government? And can he advise what steps the next UK Government could take to avoid these same problems occurring in the future? Minister. Uh, yeah, it's a very good point and something I've covered. Um, the lack of clarity um, and the late uh, confirmation of consequentials across a whole range of spending um, areas is, um, makes it difficult to manage this budget and to land it um, within the very narrow uh, limits of 0.6 per cent that we have uh, nevertheless managed to, uh, to achieve. Um, I, any future UK government, I think it would be um, very um, helpful and indeed essential for them to lay a more robust process, uh, working with the Scottish Government and other uh, devolved administrations to give much earlier sight of the impact of consequential so that that planning process um, could be done uh, early in the financial year, not only to give us some um, uh, more certainty and allow us to manage this position more accurately, but also, frankly, um, chopping and changing the numbers through the year, of course, is quite an inefficient way of managing the operational aspects of this, and everybody would prefer certainty because it would allow them to plan better right throughout the public sector sector and indeed uh, the people that benefit from the money that we, uh, we then pass on to the third sector and elsewhere. So I think that would be an, an ask, a significant ask of any incoming uh, uh, UK government. I call Ross Cruz to be followed by Ronan Mackay. Thank you. The Minister will be aware of the concern that I have raised previously that the education portfolio bears a disproportionate burden in in-year budget balancing exercises because unlike a lot of other portfolios, it has areas of spending that can be reallocated in year. The cumulative impact over that, uh, of that over the last few years has been disproportionate, though. Does the Minister recognise that as much as these are in-year exercises to get us to the end of the financial year, they do need to be viewed in that year-on-year -year, uh, balance and recognition made of the fact that certain portfolios have borne a disproportionate bu uh, burden? And I think those decisions probably wouldn't have been made if they'd been looked at in the round over a three- or five-year period. Mm -hmm. Minister. 
I, I think a lot of this comes back to the, the issue around about certainty. If we were in a, a, the fortunate position of having multi-year um, budgets from UK government, we'd be in a position to be able to manage that more effectively, and, that, and that, that's self-evidently the case. Um, I, I've already commented on the importance that the government places on, on education for, for many, many um, very valid and important, uh, important reasons, um, and the in-year position has been managed um, by uh, uh, the Cabinet Secretary and, uh, and the team to ensure that uh, we again land uh, a balanced budget um, with a, a very, very slight um, uh, underspend, um, and that, of course, ne necessitates us taking steps in year, again, because of a lack of certainty um, as we move through the year and because of uh, the, the very, very difficult, uh, unprecedentedly difficult fiscal position that we find ourselves in. I call Rona Mackay to be followed by Pam Gozo. Thanks, Presiding Officer. It is clear that the current UK Government cuts to Scotland's capital budget need to be reversed with urgency. Can the Minister advise whether revised fiscal rules from the next UK Government would help borrowing for capital investment? Minister. Uh, the real terms reductions in our capital budget imposed by the current uh, UK Government are limiting our ability to invest the vital infrastructure that sustains our public services. A new incoming administration at the UK level must address this as a priority. We welcome the limited increases in our own capital borrowing limits that form part of the revised fiscal framework, but these are still short of what we believe is necessary to allow us to sustainably invest in our essential infrastructure. So, uh, the revisiting of the capital, the current capital borrowing limits will form part of our immediate asks of any incoming UK administration. I call Pam, Pam Gozel to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. With reference to the underspend in finance and the economy, this of course comes on the back of the recent 8.3% real terms cut to the economy portfolio in the Scottish Government's budget, at the very time when Scotland is in the urgent need of policies to stimulate economic growth. So can I ask the Minister if the Scottish Government will now meet the firm promise it made in yesterday's debate to place the much greater emphasis on finance and the economy and ensure that the money they do have available is spent as quickly as possible on boosting jobs, investment and growth? Minister. Uh, well, well, you need to tell me of all people about the importance of boosting the economy, and that is indeed what the Scottish Government has focused on. Uh, the results bear that out. I highlighted the EUI and inward investment results that again show Scotland was the best performing part of the UK outside of London for the eighth year in a row, attracting inward investment, outperforming the UK and indeed the European averages for the second year in a row. Um, and also, if you look at the recent growth statistics in the first quarter of this year, Scotland's economy uh, grew up. 0.7% higher than the growth rate across the UK as a whole. But coming to the, the issue of underspend, uh, money, of course, is, is, is allocated to um, uh, our um, very effective um, economic uh, development agencies who then spend that money um, to support the very initiatives that's been spoken about. But as I've highlighted already, uh, the situation at year end is um, often uncertain because of the lack of clarity on consequentials from the UK and when those are going to arrive. And as a consequence, there will always be uh, some transfer of funds from one year to the next, but rest assured those funds are available and indeed, indeed already been deployed to continue to support Scotland's uh, economic growth ambitions uh, in this current financial year. And I call Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Alec Cohamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Minister in his statement outlined ongoing volatility and uncertainty. Given the UK Tory government's chronic economic mismanagement, our public services are facing considerable additional pressure as resources available to support them are eroded, a situation unlikely to improve under Labour. Can the Minister advise what steps have been taken to provide certainty to our public services in this very challenging context? Minister. Our current financial situation, um, as Kenny Gibson rightly identifies, is uh, amongst the most challenging since devolution. And Scotland has faced a series of economic shocks with the COVID pandemic, the war in Ukraine, soaring inflation and the impact of Brexit. And, uh, of course, add to that long list uh, the UK government's uh, economic incompetence under the Trust administration. Um, persistent high inflation uh, has put significant pressure on public services and we have consistently called for the UK government to provide additional support and response. We have made no secret of the challenge that this presents in sustaining high-quality 
public services the people of Scotland deserve. We've had to reprioritise to meet that challenge, and that has created, unfortunately, some uncertainty. And this is uh, likely to continue into the current financial year as we address the ongoing impact of inflation. But we will continue to be transparent about those challenges and the actions we are taking to manage them. And, and I call Alec Cohalton. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, we've seen the SNP Government cut the housing budget in the middle of a housing emergency. We've seen them cut the mental health budget when people, particularly young people, are waiting an age to be seen or treated. And they've cut the drugs de uh, budget when Scotland has the worst drug deaths crisis in the whole of Western Europe and deaths increasing 10% in the last year alone. As it rolls over this underspend into the next financial year, will the Scottish Government finally commit to funding these priorities properly? Minister. Well, as uh, Alex Cole Hamilton knows, the uh, priorities in terms of budget spend are decided that the budget process and, and what we're going through here today is the, uh, the outturn for last year. And of course, already indicated the funds, uh, the, the small amount of funds in the, uh, compared to the, 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 spend, the total spend of the Scottish Government that were underspent last year are, of course, already rolled over into this fiscal year and being uh, deployed as a consequence of that. Um, there are a number of uh, inaccuracies in, in the statement that he, he makes, but rest assured, the priority of this Government, um, as outlined by the First Minister, in terms of growing the economy, eradicating, public, uh, eradicating the child poverty and improving public services uh, are, are what drives uh, this, uh, this Government and, indeed, the fiscal choices that we take to deliver on, uh, on a budget. Thank you, Minister. That concludes the ministerial statement and there will be a very short pause before we move on to the next item of business to allow front bench teams to change position should they so wish. Thank you.